Dr. Masood. Hello, Salam. Salam alaikum. How are you? Can you hear good. me? How are you doing? I'm 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 good. I'm good. Um, so I'm in Scotland, in Dundee. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I teach in Dundee University. So I'm more in the politics and international relations. Um, okay. But I I I teach Middle East politics a bit but through like international relations perspective. Okay. But I bring Edward Scythe quite a lot uh, when we try to you know, explore you know, things happen in the Middle East, especially okay. like post Second World War situation. Um, so I, I mean, uh, whenever I try to learn more about Edward Said, I try to go back to your YouTube channel. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, like I, I, I actually never saw you personally, but it looks like I kind of know you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. I, I had started recording primarily for my students. Mm. And then uh, people from all over the world, especially in the pandemic, they started mm. using it. So it kind of, mm. now it has become kind of uh, more of my academic activity actually is on these videos. You know? <laughs> I was like trying to know a bit more about you and it seems like you are expert on something else as well like you are a life coach. Oh yeah, I got a certificate and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I was planning to leave uh, academia I was trying to see what else could I do so I took one course, 6 months course on that. Mm. And then I took about 30 courses on user experience design. Oh my God. So, but nothing panned out in that because, you know, they want younger people. So, <laughs> like my plan is to just like have a conversation and also know, I think people should know about you as well. You know, the things you have been doing for some oh, time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Whatever you, yeah. you want to so, talk about. Like my first question can be like, uh, where are you born and raised, Dr. Masood? Okay. So, First of all, thank you so much for having me and for this conversation. So I am originally from Pakistan. So I was born in a small town, not a small town, in the city of Rawalpindi, which is right next to the capital Islamabad. And uh, then I went to school there, went to a boarding school. And then after 10th grade, I joined the Junior Military Academy at 19 and a half, I was a second lieutenant in Pakistan Army. Um, I joined the infantry, served for 10 years. Okay. And uh, then I resigned my commission in 1996 and came to United States. Mm. So that's a part of my early life. Mm. I mean, that, that's quite interesting. So like, I mean, what drove you to join the army? Well, I mean, I came from a military family okay. and uh, the region of Pakistan that I am from, it's called Potohar. Mm. And these are, uh, this is a pretty arid region, uh, region with, you know, mostly people are farmers, but they depend on the rains. Mm. So they traditionally, the Rajputs have always been um, soldiers. Mm -hmm. So the reason I come from, you know, every family has officers and soldiers in the Pakistan mm -hmm. army. So that's what my parents wanted me to do when I was fairly young. <laughs> <laughs> because I need to tell a bit my story as well. Because I was born in Bangladesh. So like my family is from Bangladesh, but most of them moved to Scotland. And so like half of my life I spent in Bangladesh and Australia and then came here. So like Pakistan, Bangladesh is quite you know, the history, oh, yeah. all those things. Um, um, so that's quite interesting, like the your military background. Um, but like going back to your, like the, if you go back to your like memory lane, I mean, how did you think your parents like shape your understanding about the world? Well, I mean, you know, my parents, they were, were they were kind of in a way ahead of their time. You know, in fifties, they decided coming from a very traditional family background, they decided to have only three children, right? 
when in our rural families, people always wanted to have more children. And then they decided to invest in our education. I mean, they made sure that we had tutors, we went to the best schools, because uh, their wish was that what they could not accomplish during their early years, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they wanted their children to give the best possible chances. So in a way, like, you know, they helped us develop reading habits early on. Mm. And uh, so their contribution was that scholastically, we were all three of us, my sister and my brother and I, we were very highly prepared. Mm. But then besides that, they, especially our mother, she also trained us to be kind and generous and, mm. um, and to take care of other people. So in a way, they gave us the skills to succeed in life, but also a kind of moral grounding that wasn't necessarily religious, mm, mm. but it was ethical and it was connected to others and taking mm. care of them. So I would say that's what our parents, you know, gave me, but also to all of our, mm. to all our siblings, my siblings. Mm, mm. Like my own, memory with Pakistan recently is I, I had two PhD students from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So one is from Islamabad and the other one is from KP. Um, they're two different, so their politics is different. Yeah. They, they, they have different understanding about Pakistan's politics. Um, but, oh, also, yeah. but also, they, I mean, I met like two of these amazing persons. Uh, they're the kindest people I've ever known, I mean. Uh, absolutely amazing amazing like as a human being as a friend and is still there in touch with me you know for anything and i'm mm -hmm. always in touch with them i mean it's it's a very good memories for me and and i know their families as well so they brought their mm -hmm. family here um so very good memories so and you know my generation was the last generation that had bengali friends mm. Mm -hmm. Because 71, uh, we were like just starting school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, I can remember saying goodbye to my friends and not understanding the reason. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so at least my generation is the one that, the last generation that actually remembers that we lived together, mm. we used to be neighbors, mm. and it wasn't pa Bangladesh and Pakistan then. Mm. Uh, so I have, uh, I still have this beautiful memory of another boy who was older than me and his best friend. And they were being, you know, they were moving as a family I think they were going to go to Karachi, but they were be being given government transport. And this kid uh, took off a ring that he was wearing and oh. he gave it to his friend. It's such a, it's kind of etched on my memory that that, mm. that gesture that these kids, they didn't know why, mm. you know, their friends were leaving in mass, but, but that love was there despite mm. the politics and everything else. Mm. That shows how that you know the the world we created, and how mm -hmm. we become displaced from our yeah. own spaces. I mean, um, so like I mean, with me, like I, I I live in Scotland, but part of me is actually Bangladesh. The memory is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so like it's like kind of Edward Said's idea about you know we are always outsider. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Because I mean, look at I mean Said reached the apex of accomplishment of any scholar in the West. But I mean, do you think at any single moment we feel like he was fully accepted or he never felt alienated from the very institutions he served? I think, I mean, that comes across very clearly in his mm -hmm. uh, biography, autobiography. But, but I mean, that's the price I think you have we have to pay in a way uh, to live elsewhere and still dwell where we came from mm. because mm. that's an 
action, you can never sever that cultural connection. Mm. And then when we live, you live in Scotland, I live in United States, um, you know, we, our identities are already marked, right? I mean, there will be people who will see us uh, as a good presence in this space. And there will be people who without knowing us prejudge us, mm -hmm. and, you know, set us aside for the way we look or mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, with me, like, I mean, though we are in the academia for some time now, I mean, it's, it's always difficult, you know, I, I think it's like both sides, that are my perception about them and their perception about me. Um, but it's, it's like, you know, what, like Edward Said was talking about this power relations, power relations mm. is always there in, a, in an implicit way. And oh, yeah. I think part of the thing is like othering is, is, is like, you know, it's, it's only me understand, but, but for, for them, it's just like passing thing. I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter. Um, sometimes I go to places, you know, like, I mean, as if I don't exist there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's very, and it's not conservative or liberal or whatever, mm. you know, in academia, there were people who acknowledged my contributions and respected me for it. And there were people who were outrightly dismissive of what I did. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't say, because there is a central norm, right? If you are in a literature department, there are powerful people who think what literary studies is. And that's the norm. Mm. And then you are either a token hire or someone who doesn't do Shakespeare and mm. stuff like that, and hence may be less important. Mm. Um, but I think what I saw as a privileged position was the students. Yeah. Students who came to us, who were curious, mm. who acknowledged that our presence mattered to them in that department, mm -hmm. uh, that, that our work was important to them. And mm. that's the kind of work they wanted to do. Mm. So I think you have, must have experienced it also. And of course, Saeed did was that, mm. You learn to fight your battles, but you also learn to relish mm. the good that you encounter. Mm. Because if we just focus, if we walk into this world with a chip on our shoulder, it can be a terrible experience because there are so many things mm. when we live in exile mm. that send us signals of you know non-acceptance or hostility mm. sometimes mm. Mm. and uh, i think that's it's important to focus on whatever positive the world throws at us <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm like personally i'm also involved in politics here as well i'm quite an activist um, um so more with the like you know oppressed and you know, try to do things um but our number is very small you know, we are very mm -hmm. small numbers. <laughs> um, and, and like, it's like, it, it frustrates me, you know, the, the things we kind of, you know, want to see, like the change. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you look at UK's politics, I mean, Tories are the most successful political party. I mean, mm -hmm. UK's political history lasts 300 years. I mean, it's just unbelievable story. I mean, um, and it's not like the Tories are bad, but the, how people perceive them as, you know, like natural born rulers, they are good. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you no, know, the empire is gone, but it's, it's just there, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's also like, you know, the politics of the right anywhere, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Scotland, mm -hmm. UK, United States, uh, the politics of the right is always going to be more powerful because it's it relies on emotions. Right? Mm. And if you look at how we make decisions, it's the midbrain that makes our decisions for our, us. Mm. And the midbrain is connected to emotions. Yeah. The rational brain at the end 
after we've already made a decision comes and gives us a rationalization. Mm -hmm. So the politics of the left are politics of logic, statistics. Mm -hmm. Here is what we have done. Here is how many roads we have built. And mm -hmm. here is what we'll do to the school system. Your children will have access to health care. Those mm -hmm. are all rational policies. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. politics of the right is these brown people are going to come and take over your land. You are becoming extinct in your own land. You are being replaced. We will make sure no one takes your place. We will make sure you remain the dominant group. Those are politics of the emotions. Mm -hmm. They sell better. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you can always tell people someone is out to get them and mobilize them. Mm -hmm. So against that, I always go back to Freire. Mm -hmm. And even say is that we must also mobilize a politics of love, mm -hmm. care, mm -hmm. and, and then imbue it with policy and all that. Mm -hmm. But there is a famous uh, instance where it becomes clear in American politics is when I think it was the second Reagan Carter debate. Mm. You know, Reagan would give his opinions about all, and Carter was like, In my presidency, 75% of people have done this, 65% <laughs> people have access to health care. And Reagan would sit down and say, There you go, Mr. President, talking about statistics again. I mean, that was a moment where you realize that it was going to be the rhetorical flourish, mm. not facts that mm. will be important to people. Uh, mm. So I don't know. I mean, uh, I have tried to train myself to, to write politically. And I, most of my written work, if you have read it, is a politically strident work. Mm. Mm. But to do it from a place of love so mm. that at least those whom I am opposing mm. will at least read it you know, before mm. they make up their mind. Mm. I don't know how effective that is, but mm. there is a lot to learn from Paolo Freire. Mm. I mean, I've read that book a hundred times, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And uh -huh. from Saeed, I mean, even though towards the end of his life, you know, he he was disappointed and angry at the mm. word. Mm. I mean, for someone such as him to fight all his life for the rights of his own people and see not getting anywhere, I, I can understand that kind of frustration. Mm. I mean, I was doing a podcast with, he's, he's a like law professor. He studied in UCLA and he was a student when Edward Said actually visited just before Iraq invasion. And he still remember, you know, how like, you know, the other groups came with full force and tried to stop his speech. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and, and if I read this speech again and again, I can see that he was really worried, you know, what America will do to this country. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, how Iraqis are feeling right now. So that perception is not there at all. So the oh, no. kind of like knowledge was already created that these people are actually, you know, problematic and we need to do something about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is, in a way, the core argument of Orientalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that I was reading this particular page where he says it's not, we, we don't just say that here is the real Orient, you're not representing mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. but that the European subject, political subject, encounters the Orient as already pre-constituted, mm -hmm. right? So for Iraq war to happen, there needed to be a larger cultural conception of Iraq as a hostile place, mm. as a place that needed to be controlled, as a place that was threatening. And it was under those registers that a war could be sold. Mm. And that in its essence is the modern form of Orientalism that you don't even have to give facts, you can fabricate things. Mm. Mm. But you can move a large segment of your society against a country based on those assumptions. And that is Orientalism, right? Because like Saeed in his introduction, 
what he's, I think he's trying to highlight is, I mean, he's using Foucault, he acknowledges yeah. that, it is that it's a body of knowledge perpetuated through conferences, through ac academia, through journals, newspapers, all of them assuming and representing certain things about a place called the Orient or Iraq. Mm. So thus people are incapable of thinking outside of that discourse. So mm. when you mention Iraq and Saddam Hussein to them, it already, I mean, it comes across in his book, Covering Islam, if you remember, mm. Mm. he yeah. talks about how the, the Muslims are already pre-constituted mm. as terrorists, as weak, as needed to be put down. Mm. Mm. And all those tropes then emerge in these war rhetorics. Mm. If you remember before the invasion of Afghanistan, after September 11, everywhere, uh, you know, these images were emerging, emerging of women in the burqas. And it was, as Kaitri Spivak famously says, it was white men saving brown women from brown men. Right? Mm. But, that, but, but also like brown men is also irrational, terrorist. Yeah. Domineering, yeah. Yeah. vicious, all kind of tropes there as well. Yeah. So I mean, so I think that a lot of people read Orientalism incorrectly mm. because people come, my students used to come to me and say, well, well, there is no agency here that we see that the Orients themselves have something to say. And that mm. was one of the biggest critiques of Said. And Said actually in the afterward and even in the introduction mm. clearly says that the project here is not to prove what acts of resistance were mobilized by the Orientals themselves. Mm. His project was to suggest that there is a discourse called Orientalism, mm. which is perpetuated through knowledge, through power of being there and being able to record. Mm. Kind of, to have the power to conquer Egypt and then record it mm, mm. from your own scientific so-called perspective. So within that, the book's project was to give us a genealogy of how Orientalism mm. established itself and how it works. Mm, mm. And then he goes on in his other works to then tell us you know, how the natives responded, how they resisted. Mm. There is um, there's an interview of Said, I think it's available on YouTube as well, where he explains that. I mean, he explains in simpler terms that what he wanted to write about was as to why is it that when the Arab word is mentioned or the Middle East is mentioned in the Western press or to a common person in America or UK or Scotland, mm -hmm certain ideas about that place emerge in people's mind. Where do those ideas come from? Mm. Mm. And that is what he tries to explain mm. through the term Orientalism. And I think for anyone, any scholar who wants to work on the global periphery or a clear understanding of how political discourses work. I think Saeed is important, especially mm -hmm. Orientalism. Mm -hmm. just, just a bit of background here. Like, I mean, um, when did you start reading Edward Said? Because you, you, you had a like military background and then you switched to the academia mm -hmm. and then more. So like, what was that moment? Like you felt that, oh my God. Well, that's a really good question. So when I came to United States, uh, you know, they didn't accept my Pakistan Military Academy degree as a, as a full bachelor's degree. So I had to do two years of undergraduate work, which was a blessing in disguise. So as I was doing that and got my bachelor's and moved into the master's, mm. um, I talked to my professors and I was at a small Baptist university and people were really great and nice, but there was no one was post-colonialist or anything else. Mm. 
Mm. But one of my professors said, well, for your master's thesis, Masood, why don't you bring in something from your own cultural background and use it to write a master's thesis? Mm. And I was going to write on Salman Rushdie then. Okay. So that's when I went on this search for, you know, who has written what about the Muslim world and the mm. Islamic world? What are the big names? So that's when I chose post-colonial studies or mm. post-colonial theory as my, and then as you read, of course, you can't do post-colonial theory without reading Edward Said. Mm. So actually mm. the first book I read was Orientalism. And then I moved on to, you know, Spivak and Homi Baba, mm. Fanon mm. and, you know, Laila Abu Logad and Iqbal Ahmed and all the mm. Iqbal Ahmed I already knew about okay. and, and, and other reader, writers. Yeah. Mm. So like it kind of opened up the whole new world for you. For me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and then did, when you did your PhD, it kind of went into that kind of area as well. Oh yeah, when, when I did my PhD, I already had applied to study post-colonial theory and post-colonialism. Mm -hmm. And then most of my work at Florida State was reading texts, you know, Saeed and other texts and, and uh, expanding my understanding of post-colonial studies. So I went into studying uh, globalization cosmopolitanism, theories of nationalism, because all of these were important to have uh, an understanding of. And I was already interested in Marxism, even in Pakistan army. So that mm. also became a part of that. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, that's, that's one interesting point where Edward Said was criticized because kind of misunderstood Karl Marx. Um, oh yeah, especially where he quotes here. Yeah, and well, you know, like, okay. Um, he slightly read that quote out of context. You mm, know, mm. They cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. Yeah. Uh, because that quote, and then Spivak has a wonderful reading of that essay by okay. Marx in Can the Subaltern Speak? I mean, well, I mean, Marx isn't saying that they cannot, he's trying to say how can the peasants under mm. um, Louis Napoleon mm. who had just given rights to, to them, how can they constitute a class? Mm. And in order to constitute a class, it was uh, since they had no patronum, they had no father, what he's suggesting is that someone it's a question of political representation and to constitute a class, then they must be represented by someone. So I think that's a misreading and everyone knows it. Mm. Uh, but even, you know, even the great minds of our time, the great scholars mm. of our times have these slippages in their work. That doesn't necessarily mean, mm. even if we deconstructed Orientalism it doesn't hinge on that one no, search. No, so, no, but also like um, I think in the in the opening of the book, I mean, he mentioned about this Disraeli's quote that East is a career. I think that's mm -hmm. an amazing quote. Oh yeah. Can you expand on that? I think it's it's from Tancred, which was yeah. one of the three novels. I think. So I mean, what. Well, I mean, think of it in, in uh, what did colonialism enable the British uh, merchant classes and nobles to do? Now, if you, you are, of course, more familiar with that, I mean, in the, in the feudal system of British, even though the colonialism had risen, uh, you know, only the, the promogenitor, um, only the eldest son mm. would inherit the estate. That means the second sons and third sons of the nobility had to go and find their own fortune. Mm. Where did they find their fortunes? In the colonies. One way of doing that was that the second sons would go to, to the Caribbean, to the Creole families, to the white Creole families. 
And uh, since the white Creole families wanted to marry their sons and daughters into the merchant classes or the nobility, they will give a dowry, sometimes 60,000 pounds, 30,000 pounds. So these second sons will go to the Caribbean, get married to a Creole woman, and that would fund their mm. you know, success. Uh, the greatest example of that is uh, Jane Eyre, the novel in mm -hmm. which Rock, Rock, Rockester brings Bertha Mason to London because she is his wife and she gives the capital with which he starts their life. Mm -hmm. So that's like one way of seeing the East being a career. But literally for so many of the upper middle class young men, mm -hmm. The entire uh, system of British civil services that was expanded to the colonies, you know, you didn't just go there, you, you mm. enjoyed a certain lifestyle, mm. certain privileges. Mm. And, and so that's just in terms of as government functionaries. But mm. as writers, if you want to write imaginative fiction or a travelogue, East was a career for you, you know, because you traveled to Egypt and what did you write? The mm -hmm. My account of Egypt, even Burton smuggles himself to, to the Holy Kaaba and writes an account of that. Mm -hmm. Writing about the Orient or using Oriental tropes mm -hmm. in poetry. I mean, I mean the, it goes all the way back to Goethe. I mean, Mm. If, you, if you read uh, the Divine Comedy, even, you know. Uh, so East has always been a career. Mm. Mm. The Orient, especially for the writers, for the mm. painters, the Dutch Impressionists mm. and everyone else. Because, but how, because that mystery about it, mm. that, you know, sexualized images, that timelessness that was associated with it. In all those senses, I mean, Disraeli is writing in the book that I think the dialogue is East isn't a place, it's a career, right? But mm. What Said is then proving in the book is mm. how does it become a career, mm. right? Mm. I mean, it, it generates discourses, it, ge it creates societies, conferences, mm institutions of oriental studies, mm. journals, mm. right? And experts in orientalism. Mm. So you, if, 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 if England is sending out an expedition somewhere, you will have your experts tell you how to tame the natives. How, mm. But think of it, we think in terms of the past. Mm. When uh, Bush the second was mm. getting ready to invade Iraq, right? Mm. Who were the experts around him, right? Bernard Lewis and yeah. uh, all these neoconservatives, yeah. right? Yeah. Who had this idea of you can't talk to the Arabs, you have to mm. conquer them. It was the same career, right? These experts, mm. Mm. you know, whispering things and presenting things to the powerful. And I think what Saeed is saying is, you know, it's not just an unmotivated encounter. It's an encounter that already is pre-constituted through the power dynamics. Mm. And it's imbued with all kinds of imaginative things associated with the region. Mm. There's an example he gives in his, one of his interviews is that he was reading Lang, his history of the Arab people. Mm. And then he was reading Nerwal. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, what he realized was that the poet was saying the same thing that the historian had said. And it struck him that no one was experiencing the Orient as it is. They would go there with their expected view already shaped. Mm. And I always use this example in my classes when I was trying to explain this is that think of it this way. Uh, you're, you're going to Jamaica. Mm. Mm. One way of going to Jamaica is you buy a ticket and you just get there, but it's never that. Even before you decide to go to Jamaica, there, there are certain views that you already have, beaches, free mm. drinks. Mm. But more than that, let's say you buy a travel book before mm. you go there. 
So then Jamaica for you is 10 best things to do in Jamaica. Your experience of Jamaica then is, oh, this wasn't as good as the travel book said. Mm. So that, in that sense, then the expectations of the place or people are already shaped in your mm. mind, in your consciousness. So even before you've met them, you have an opinion of them. And when you mm. meet them, all you are looking at is, does it match the opinion that I've already formed? Mm. Mm. I mean, like in my case, one of the example I gave, like what, like Edward Said also mentioned about uh, John Stuart Mill's father, James Mill. Uh, so he's like, you know, a Scottish Enlightenment thinker, you know. Mm -hmm. so he was very famous. So his friends are like, you know, like all those famous economists like Ricardo. But he, he suddenly he decided to write on India. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only he wrote like a book, he wrote like six volumes on India never been to India, he knew mm -hmm. nothing about India. Uh, but the problem is what you said, you know, the East is a career, but lots mm -hmm. of people, lots of students who will go to like Oxford, Cambridge, other universities, will actually learn from his book about India. And these same people will be posted in those yeah. colonies. Um, so these are not innocent writing because they have those perception about the, about the country which is already, they know that these people are actually, you know, weak, you know, these people are bad, their weather is bad, their religion is like, you know, backdated, all kind of like oh, yeah. things are already there. So what, I think that's why the colonial setting creates so much violence against the like local people, because these are not actually, you know, human beings. No. Uh, they are not seen as equal human beings. Yeah. Yeah, I so, mean, you can see that like uh, there was a, in the 18th or late, early 19th century, there was a scientific text that was taught, which was called the, the wild man's pedigree or I'm forgetting. And in that they would associate different attributes to different races. So white, and they, they would explain it through humoral theory. Mm -hmm. So white was sanguine because its dominant humor was blood, right? Uh, black was phlegmatic because its dominant humor was phlegm, right? Mm -hmm. So these were things were being taught as science, right? And obviously like when, when you're trained like that and even your leisure reading, I mean, we don't talk about it in literature classes, but a huge genre sub-genre of 19th, 20th century literature was, was the sexual tales of the Orient. Mm. You know, it would be exploits of a young officer in Peshawar and then his encounters with different women. So, so like there was one book called Venus in India. It was very popular amongst the British officers, right? So these men already went into India, not just expecting that these people are less than human or all, but also that this was a place where you could have all your desires fulfilled mm -hmm. and, and unrestrained desires. Mm -hmm. And you couple that with these are our conquered people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, I mean, East as a career literally was a career for those who, who, who could have never succeeded in their own culture, but it also gave them this entire realm of imagination and, mm. and then writing about it, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Even now, I mean, I mean, think of the fiction or non-fiction accounts being published here in United States. I mean, how many books can you sell? I visited Alabama, right? But you can always sell a book, my seven years in Tibet, right? Yeah. Or, you know, two years in the Chattagong Hill tribes, right? Yeah. yeah. Because that's exotic. It's already been, has been exoticized. Mm. Uh, so it becomes a career. Mm. Uh, mm. Even now, it plays that role. Mm. And especially you kind of mentioned about like Bernard Lewis when he was hired as an expert on Iraq. I mean, like people like Edward Said, obviously horrified. He was still alive then. And 
in his lifetime, he spent like, you know, he was saying this, this guy is racist. I mean, so. Yeah, and Said okay. mentions that Orientalism too in the afterward. The problem with uh, Daniel Pipes and Bernard Lewis and these people is what Said used to say, I think I saw it in that one thing about the Orientalists, the 19th century Orientalists, was that they at least loved their subject. Yeah. yeah. They, they romanticized it, but they at least loved the Orient. The problem with the Arabists, right, Bernard Lewis and others, is that they hate the subject mm. that, they, they, that they are supposed to be experts in. Mm. Um, and, and I actually reviewed a book by a historian. Um, he was, I think, at the Naval War College. And mm. this book was, and the thing is, the problem with the American right is that there, and I mentioned it in my review, is that there is no review process. Right? I actually went and wrote an article on it too, is that this person's second chapter was and slay the idolat idolaters, right? Which is from Surah at toba right? Okay. And so what he's arguing is that the Quran tells the Muslims to kill all non-Muslims, right? And, 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 for an uncritical reader, he's citing the Quran, he's citing a verse of it. But what he's not citing is that at is the only chapter of the Quran which doesn't have the exordium, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. It doesn't start with God the compassionate and merciful. And mm. two, before that verse is there, there is, there is a set of verses which says, this is the culmination point of your conflict with your enemies. You have exhausted all your options. Mm. They have now broken treaties. Mm. Now you must fight, right? Mm. So, so, so both the Muslim right-wingers and, and these people, they misread it, right? And yeah. so I went and wrote, I think an article which was called Jihad in Islam just as a response to that. But going back to this scholar who claimed to be an Arabist, claimed to be a Muslim scholar, mm. cherry picking the thing that he could use to represent that Islam by its very nature inherently mm. is mm. anti-West and anti-human, right? Mm. Mm. And that's the kind of thing that Said would challenge them on, right? He, mm. he was like, no, it's not as simple as that. and. Uh, and which we need to do too, because I mean, I don't know if you have had a chance to take a look at my this my book that just came out in February. Uh, that's what I was trying to do in that democratic criticism. Mm -hmm. My main concern was, okay, yes, I believe in freedom of expression, but I teach graduate students in a world where we also teach them you know, we have to be careful of others' feelings. We have to be careful of, we have to at least understand and empathize why people feel a certain way. Mm. Why aren't we teaching that to them? Mm. Right? Mm. That's about Muslims, right? Mm. So if, if, a, if a text hurts general Muslim sensitivities, makes, makes mm. them sad or angry, mm. instead of telling them, oh, you know, you should grow up. We can say things like that. Why don't we try to understand that anguish? Mm, mm. Where does it come from? Mm, mm. In order to do that, we'll have to understand what their idea of the sacred is. What is sacred to them? What is it that they think? What is the limit beyond which they would not want you to go, right? Mm, mm. It's not like the Muslim reader cannot tolerate criticism of their mullahs and readers and everything else, of course they can. Mm. So that was what that book was about. Like, obviously I could have not written it had I not read Saeed and people mm. like him. Um, I mean, if you want to touch like the modern stuff, what's going on, especially after 9-11, um, like I think one of, one of the latest report came from like Brown University, so they did a kind of cost analysis of the war on terror. So basically they are saying that it, it cost $8 trillion, this 20 years war. It killed 
almost a million people. That's the like lowest estimate. And they went after like, especially like 12 countries. These are the like poorest of the poor countries. Mm-hmm. And all our 99% are like Muslim countries. Um, so it shows the power of that, that, that discourse. discourse and the Orient, you know. You just went after them year after year and then spent serious amount of money. And, and most of the money obviously came from the taxpayers as well. So taxpayers also understood that discourse that, yeah, this makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and also like, and this comes from like the neoliberal critiques of neoliberalism and others is that since the Western government, like the US government, even though Biden is trying it, since they can no longer justify themselves through good works, right? They can't go and say, I'll give you free education and free health care, mm. right? Mm. So they're in, they've increasingly become security states. Right? Mm. So they would say, well, you know, you're on your own if you don't have health care. But if someone tries to threaten you, we have the biggest military in the world to, to protect you. So states have, these liberal states have increasingly become police states, right? Mm. Mm. Because that's easier to sell. Uh, we will make stricter laws to keep these undesirables out, to punish mm. them, to give them the maximum sentence. And we will send our army to stem the tide of terrorism before it reaches our soil. Mm. That sells better, right? It, it, mm. it, it's easier to sell fear to the people mm. and make them uncritical and it feeds the large military industrial complex, right? Mm. I mean, where are you going to test your weapons? I mean, Mm. as cynical as it sounds, I mean, if you look at Afghanistan, all Mm. the major new weapon systems were tested there. Uh, Same in Iraq. Uh, It's now happening in Ukraine. Um, I mean, I I am for supporting Ukraine against Russia. I'm against any aggression against any nation. But on the other hand, if, if we want to do peace, right, peace. Mm-hmm. I always guess, give, gave this example to my students. I mean, okay, if you, the one narrative that was sold was that in Iraq, we will create a viable democracy, mm. right? Which was, if you really wanted to do that, if United States wants to do that, solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, it's a tiny little state of Palestine with like 7 million people. Mm. Pump in, you know, $50 billion into that state. It already has the most educated Arab population in the world. It already has the most resilient young population. Create the state of Israel, give them the resources, and within 10 years, they will build themselves as a model democracy in the Middle East without a military intervention. They have stayed democratic over the last 70 years, despite what is being done to them, mm. right? Mm. But since that doesn't make sense, that doesn't sell well, right? Mm. Because peace, peace doesn't sell well, especially I mean, it would be hard to convince the American public to say we are going to take $15 billion and reconstruct Palestine than saying there is a threat coming to us from Mali and we need to send an expedition and it will cost $50 billion. That's Mm. easier to sell. Mm. 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 Cynical as it sounds because war in the name of security. Mm. Mm. So I think like I mean, what can you, me, and everyone else do is to continue speaking about these things, Mm. you know, continue pointing it out. I mean, that's the least we can do Mm. other than actually putting our bodies in the street and working with other groups in solidarity for peace, for greater understanding. Mm. But also like when you talk about like democracy, the mass, um, so, even if you see like this war on terror, it looks like mass is co-opted in that war. Yeah. Um, so these are not a small number. You're talking about you know, 80, 100 million, using like most of this yeah. evangelical Christians and you know, the right wing, the conservatives, the Republicans. It's a big number, it's a big number. Oh yeah, 
I mean, like look at it. I mean, 48% of Americans were mm -hmm. for that, are for that. And that's a, not a small number in the most powerful nation on the planet. Mm. And part of it is also, I mean, if you look at the American educational system, mm. Mm. it is increasingly the K-12 system. I'm not even talking about universities. Mm. What's being the way the, the government's provided education is being run is we are increasingly producing less and less criticism, uh, critical citizens. Mm. The emphasis is on rote memory and testing mm. Mm. and not on critical thinking or asking good questions. There is hardly any civic education being given. Mm. And if you are in a conservative state, chances are you're not even being taught real history. You know, not real history, but a complicated history, like in Texas or in Florida. So, so increasing, and that's the problem with the conservative politics anywhere, is that mm -hmm. they need an uncritical population, a population mm -hmm. not, that can do the computations and mm -hmm. do the jobs that are needed, mm -hmm. but that are not critically aware of why their lived conditions are like that. And that's why you see in UK and here too, is that there is emphasis on more vocational education and all attempts at creating a debate oriented classroom or a classroom that encourages students to think critically of the nation, of their own privilege uh, oh. are made to look suspect because if people start doing that, then it's harder to sell them simplistic narratives. Mm, mm. I mean, I think I'm the first person who started some studies on Middle East in my university. <laughs> um, I mean, like most of the students who come to my course, like it's like fourth year module advanced course. I mean, most of them have got no understanding, previous background about any understanding about Middle East. Um, so that their understanding about the popular media and, and it's, it's quite fascinating that the way they start and the way they finish. And then, you know, um, I, I try to be in touch with my former students and, and, you know, at least I feel that, you know, these students will be like more humane, more, mm -hmm. you know, compassionate about, about the understanding about, about the Middle East, about the Arab world, about the Muslims. Um, so I think that's the only, I think only thing you can get out of this. You know, as, as teachers and as public scholars, I mean, the most I think we can do is at least complicate the simplistic picture mm. and, and focus on empathy and understanding. And I would say at both ends of the global divide, like when I am at, in Pakistan, mm. my attempt always is is to humanize Americans for them. Mm. Mm. And to, to always point out that yes, there are a lot of racists in the United States and UK, but there are millions upon millions of decent human beings as well, mm. because it's important to acknowledge that. Mm. You know, otherwise both sides would keep thinking of each other as this other mm. in that Orientalist mode, right? And 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 not see each other on a human level mm. Mm. as fellow humans. Mm. But you're right, like I can tell you that one person with a different set of texts and a different way of looking at things at any given institution, even when they are not even forcefully arguing one way or the other, mm. Mm. can make a huge difference mm. in students' lives. Sometimes they might have never encountered a text from you know, Iran or Bangladesh mm. or India or Pakistan. Mm. Sometimes they might have never had, have had a, an intellectual conversation from someone from out there. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, not just that it gives them new knowledges, it also, it kind of humanizes the other for mm. them, mm. Mm. which is important especially in societies that are that are predominantly one ethnic group or mm. you know one social or class mm. the things you're talking about this critical thinking 
even in the academic sectors. So these things are now coming out, like, you know, even our university's connection with the slavery, even like one of our buildings, like the teaching buildings called Dalhousie building. So like Dalhousie is oh. art that, you know, the colonial rulers in India. So we, we have different memories about mm -hmm. this, this like dynasty, I mean, uh, but here it's like, they're well respected. They are like, well, like revered, you know, so they, they, they are the Earls, they are the Dukes. I'm not sure Edward mentioned about, I think Edward talked about Balfour, but no, oh, yeah. two, two of the people who did like more dangerous things for the Middle East, which is like Sykes-Pico Treaty. So like mm -hmm. Sykes-Pico Treaty, I mean, even the, if you see the Pico guy, the, the, the French guy, I mean, his party's name is actually Colonial Party. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> so he became expert on the Middle East and the other guy, the Sykes, he just a kind of travel traveler in like targeting mm -hmm. other places. And suddenly he became an expert on the Middle East. And then these two people more or less drew the map of the whole. Yeah. And like, if you lo look at his discussion of Balfour's mm -hmm. uh, statement, I think what Saeed is also trying to highlight isn't just what Balfour says about Egypt, mm. but the way it is said is that the vocabularies that are used are the vocabularies of Egypt being this little mm. uh, brother or this not autonomous enough to take care of its own affairs, still needing a firm hand and guidance from the benevolent British empire. All of these ways of, I mean, think of it, India, if you look at Indian history, mm. uh, even Churchill's argument was that Indians are not ready for self-governance. The idea of not being ready was attributed to not being educated enough, not being civilized enough. And, and meanwhile, people like me and you are saying, well, you had 250 years if you had given them the full right to develop their systems and infrastructures and universities, why wouldn't they have been ready, right? Mm -hmm. So, but this idea somehow that they are not ready to take the same argument was used post Iraq war that Iraqis are not ready to self govern mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and meanwhile, I mean, we have a nation here, United States of America, you know, 100 years after its inception, it still wasn't ready to self govern. It had to fight a war in which millions died, right? Uh, to, to settle the what mm. would it be? So the same things are not applied to the European nations. So that whole idea of like treating uh, the colonies as childlike, I mean, mm. you know, as mm. uh, like Bergson would say, like natives as children, mm. and, and not considering them adults. That that trope still plays. Mm. Uh, Within these cultures, people use that for minorities, like this community is, mm. you know, they are not capable of taking care of themselves and mm. they need to be instructed or controlled. Mm. It's, it's almost like a kind of like narcissist. Yeah, type. it's like an, it's, the infantilization of the other, right? Like that you, you never treat them as, as fully mm. realized human beings. Rather than, you know, saying that we actually destroyed that. You no, know, yeah. we took everything from that. Yeah, and withheld the new knowledges that mm -hmm. could have, you know. Mm. Yeah, I always use this example. I mean, there are a lot of apologists for colonialism in India, Pakistan, and I'm sure Bangladesh too, especially older generations. Mm. Mm. Because, mm. The, and the British apologist who's like, we built this and that. Uh, my argument always is pretty simple in infrastructural terms. Mm. If Indian resources were used on India during those 200 years, and the British Lee was New Delhi infrastructurally equally as developed as the city of London. Mm. If it wasn't, then it was an exploitative relationship. If you read Achille Mamembe and others, the biggest disadvantage to the co colonial societies was not just infrastructural, 
it was that while the West was developing its discourses of liberty, freedom, feminism, all that, mm -hmm. since the inter and this comes from Chandra Mohanty's work too, since since in the colonies the emphasis was to keep peace, like the local officials would work through the tribal elders, through mm -hmm. the feudal lords. So while these systems were being disrupted in the West, they actually become hardened under colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. The mullahs become stronger because you're using them to control the people. The feudal lords become stronger because they keep the peace and you get your taxes and you tell them we will not interfere in your affairs. So all the disruptive impact of modernity and capitalism mm -hmm. is stymied and we come out with systems more ossified than what we had when they came in mm -hmm. and reactionary. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's the problem in, in let's say Islamic radicalism in Bangladesh, Jamaat Islami in Pakistan, is that if you are gonna define your cultural identity in opposition to modernity, mm. where are you? Because modernity is a contaminated experience for you because of colonialism. So you are gonna go retrieve pre-modern ways of looking at the world from your own history. Mm. And that sends us on this journey of pure identities, you know, mm. and that is a consequence of the colonial experience. I mean, if modernity had entered the Muslim world or all the other worlds as a free movement of ideas and thoughts, then we might have, we would have adopted some of them, we would have rejected some of them, but it would have not become politically a contaminating influence. Mm. Mm. But because of colonialism, it did. You know, so if you are in Bangladesh or Pakistan uh, and you're fighting for any kind of rights, you have to cut through the objections that would come from traditional interpretations of gender, traditional interpretations of what is proper, what is not, because it's so easy now to dismiss, oh, that's a Western thing, right? Mm -hmm. from, from their point of view. My idea is that there is so much good here that everyone can adopt and there is so much good in our cultures mm, that mm. can infuse the cap capitalistic world with something kind and generous and different ways of thinking the world and living in it. Mm. Because you are expert on like post-colonial theory as well, which more or less talks about it's not on the colonial time, but after the colonial time, why there are still problems there. Mm -hmm. So like what's your understanding, like, I mean, where, we can actually liberate those colonies it's still actually, you no, know, they are still colonies, it looks like. So India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, you can see the struggle, the, the oppression, it looks like it's just a different form, uh, mm -hmm. but the structure is almost the same. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, I, I see some of, your, some of your tweets about like, even like you talk about Imran Khan. So you are quite critical about Imran Khan, you know, the, how the- Oh yeah, I, I think, Populism. You yeah, know, he, you know. I mean, you know, he he his way of look. He he his politics is reactionary, and it's not useful for Pakistan or for any country, because a disruptive politics like that, which doesn't have an end goal. Mm. I mean, what is he going to do? Change the Pakistani society? How? There there is no plan to break the big feudal uh, zamindari system. There is no plan to rein in the religious fundamentalists, right? Though those people are standing with him. So at the end of the day, um, all he's offering is elect me the prime minister and I'll negotiate with IMF differently. I mean, there is no imagining that I can go to India and Bangladesh and 50 other countries and say, let's build a coalition and become a block against IMF policies and say, we will not pay your debts you mm. will forgive the debt. Mm. I mean, there is no thinking of that sort, right? Mm. Now, the global economic system, the way it is functioning right now, it needs the global poor mm. or the rich parts of the world to sustain, right? Mm. So the solution isn't we are going to meet your requirement, give us another $2 billion, right? Mm. Because if we are caught in a debt trap, we are actually working for IMF. 
Mm -hmm. The solution is for leaders of these nations to come together, people to come together and say, you know, 50 countries of the world come together and tell the IMF, we are not going to pay your debt. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? Bankrupt 50 countries? You bankrupt 50 countries, the global economy would tank, right? Mm -hmm. But but the and you know I don't know you must be familiar with it. There is an organization, loosely affiliated organization, World Social Forum. Yeah. Right. They meet every year uh, when Davos happens, and so that's where a lot of these new leftist, socialistic, but also global ideas are emerging, mm. of resistance, and and, and of cutting across the divides of religion and nation state, right? Mm. And and building alliances, people to people alliances. Mm. So I think something of that sort, not led by the leaders, but by the people Mm. who force their leaders to think in global and planetary terms. Mm -hmm. And I think the environmental justice movement is kind Mm. of leading the fray in that. Mm. but is not good mm. for a lot of people on this planet but at the same time it helps the west the you know the oh. the, the structure they love and oh, yeah. actually perpetuate the same same discourse that look at them you know these people are just you know yeah. they, they cannot take care of themselves these leaders are corrupt these leaders are you know mm-hmm. all kind of tropes there and then more or less maintain the same structure Oh um, yeah. So if they want anything, we will supply them arms, not the you know, things mm-hmm. they actually need. I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, remember when those civil wars were happening in Africa, like Charles Taylor and others? Uh, the German suppliers were supplying both sides. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. were selling arms to both sides. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, so, so I mean, pointing out these things is also important. You mm-hmm. know, like uh, Chomsky mm-hmm. is great at doing that. Mm. Uh, my mentor Robin Goodman has done a great job in her work mm. of pointing out these. I have done it. A lot of other scholars, of course, yeah. Said did that. Um, but I think, like as scholars, and you being an active scholar at a university, I think the least what we cannot do is ab- absolutely abdicate our responsibility mm. and become mm. part of the system. I think the least that we must keep alive is sharing of these ideas and constantly mm. producing knowledges, but also mm. sharing mm. these thoughts and ideas and knowledges with our students. And then mm. what they do with it is up to them. Mm. Mm. I think we we dealt with so many things. I mean, especially Edward Said and Orientalism from the modern context as well. Um, so I think, I mean, I will invite you again, you know, because these are the, still there are lots of things to talk about. Uh, we cannot oh, finish. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm just trying to you know, touch a bit the lighter things uh, because you are an academic, you are also a life coach. I mean, um, what's, what's your advice for the students who are coming to the university? What kind of mindset they need when they tend to study like this kind of area, like political science or international relations? or your, your subject area, um, what would be your advice? Well, I mean, the biggest, my request always to the students is that, you know, we live in, in, in an increasingly interconnected but unequal world, right? Where, where some of us are part of the privileged part of the world and some of us are living in those parts of world that underwrite that privilege through their labor, through their suffering. So as students, when they come to the universities, they have to make a conscious choice, right? Will they remain aligned with the privileged part of the world and be uncritic and uncritically adopt the status quo or would they try to, will they try to learn how the world works and then work in solidarity with those, you know, who are at the suffering end of this world who, and to learn to empathize with them. 
and then see what they can do in their own lives individually and collectively as they leave the university and go into their professions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be something grand, just a simple act of kindness to someone who might need your help mm -hmm. is important and significant. So to develop that kind of empathy for people all over the world, but also in your vicinity. Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, for me, like, because I mean, I, I'm quite an anxious person. I, I get agitated very easily and I overthink lots of things. Mm -hmm. What would be advice for me, like, you know, to make me more, you know, calm, more, you know, in control rather than just like explode? I mean, you know. Um, no, I mean, we all have to have our own ways of doing things, but. What I have trained myself to do is, is I realize that things will always go wrong in the world, right? And sometimes people will do things or say things that are hurtful. Mm. Um, so my strategy always is that if you push me hard enough, I will fight back. Mm. But other than that, I will just say, you know, you go your way, I'll keep on doing what I do um, mm. and not involve in these kind of debates unless it is absolutely necessary to take a stand. Mm. So my idea always is not to be offended so easily, give the other person the chance of, you know, give them the credit of not knowing, mm. give them the credit of doing something unintentionally and hear them out. And then if you disagree with them, you just tell them, you know, I disagree with you. But, you know, we all, we are human. We get angry, we get flustered. Mm -hmm. With being a minority figure in one thing that I learned early on in my career was that you want to present your ideas so that your tone doesn't become an issue, so that they don't make your tone an issue. Because it's very easy to dism dismiss Professor Abdullah. Like he's from Bangladesh, he doesn't know the norms. He gets angry when we tell him to do. But if you're calm and collected, you can be very forceful and have radical points of view. Since they can't make your tone an issue, mm. they'll have to listen to you. You know, mm. students as well. Mm. Because the moment you show them your anger, they have you. Mm. Because the mm. guy, I asked a question and he got terribly annoyed at me. But if you keep your calm and if you're quiet, mm. I mean, what are they going to say? Like I sent an, oh. said an offensive thing to him and he told me that was offensive. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so that's my kind of guiding principle. When I was a bit younger, I used to like, you know, confront them quite a lot. And I, I was like that too, you know. And I, I don't think it helped me. Yeah. And yeah. then have allies, you know, make friends, yeah. have allies. Yeah. Don't try to do it alone. Yeah. yeah. I could do, sometimes I I go to a meeting and sometimes, you know, if something is said, I, I used to just challenge them, oh, why, why did you say that? That's quite hurtful to me. Uh, um, and then, you know, you can see like the, the room is like 30 seconds, yeah. could pin drop silent because they don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah. Or you could then say that privately to that person, the same thing. Yeah. That yeah. Way they're not embarrassed. Mm. And you can have a conversation that's, about that. That's a very good advice. Yeah. I think the confrontation is not good. It's like toxic for both parties. Yeah. And it doesn't resolve things because it hardens people's positions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You take care. Bye bye. No. All right. Yeah.